our, our uh, kind of our key presenter here is Andy Lewis, and Andy comes uh, comes to us from uh, UW Extension as well, and he is. Uh, I think, I think pretty close to an expert in broadband, and so uh, he's going to be sharing a whole host of, of, of topics with us, including some broadband basics, uh, talking a little bit about barriers to broadband service, and maybe some potential strategies, and what we can do to improve our broadband service here in the area. And then, uh, like I said, we'll have a kind of a listening component. I'm, I'm real curious as to what your feedback is, and we have a couple of questions that we'll kind of pose, and I hope that kind of jump starts the conversation a little bit. And then we also invited Brett Schupner and Steve Schneider um, from, well, Brett's from Reedsburg Utility and Steve's from Bug Tussle to kind of weigh in and, and uh, share some of their, um, their uh, ideas and, and uh, help, help us with any questions you might have. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I am neglecting to mention. Oh, um, I, I don't think so. Anyone have any questions before we jump in? Okay. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andy Lewis. And um, just a quick bio, Andy's a professor at the University of Wisconsin Extension, where he currently serves as a community and economic development specialist for the Broadband and E-Commerce Education Center. Prior to his broadband assignment in 2010, he served as a community development specialist in the Center for Community and Economic Development since 2001. Uh, Andy is responsible for the development and delivery of educational and marketing materials intended to increase the utilization of broadband as a means of improving local economies and quality of life. And Lewis was part of a team that wrote two broadband technology opportunity program grants that brought more than $32 million to the state to expand broadband adoption. So with that, I will hand it over to Andy. Great. Well, thank you all for uh, coming tonight. And Jenny, maybe you could hand out these one pages. We'll have to go with that sure. with the remainder. Uh, it's, it's nice to see such a good crowd on a nice night. And thankful we don't have to compete against the Badger basketball game tonight, because we probably wouldn't have had this turnout. It's usually an indication, obviously, of the uh, interest in broadband and here in the Driftless region. Uh, we certainly have some uh, challenges in getting people the broadband that they need. Um, Jenny's handing out just a one-pager and uh, should look like this. If, if you need a copy of the presentation, it's on the web. I only brought about 25 copies, so there's not enough to go around. I tried to save some trees, and we just don't know how many people are going to show up. But if before you leave, if you're one of those people that don't have broadband access and can't get the presentation, maybe somebody could leave one of the uh, paper copies for those folks. That was really the, uh, the intention of doing that. One of the things I'm encouraged about is that we seem to have changed the equation. People are starting to ask the right kinds of questions, I think, on uh, broadband. I used to go around the state and people would say, oh, we, we already have that, Mr. Lewis, we have broadband, as if it was one flavor, one thing that you had. And it's really about uh, getting more and more bandwidth. And you'll hear a lot of people, including myself, talking about the analogy of uh, rural electrification and what it took to get electricity out to the rural areas. It's actually a great analogy, but the one difference I do see is I don't ever see the bandwidth issue, broadband issue, going away because the bandwidth needs are just continuing to go up versus rural electrification. Once you had uh, electrification of the farms, once you had three-phase electricity, the job was pretty much done. With broadband, what's happening is the bandwidth needs continue to go up, which continues to drive uh, the need for more and more uh, broadband investment. And that's one of the, I think, bad news uh, pieces I'll leave you with today is that the job is probably never going to be over. This is just a quick illustration of how bandwidth matters. Uh, this is just an example of a movie clip. We've done a lot of videos, uh, best case practices in broadband, and those files are huge. This particular file is 855 megabytes in size. And if you were unfortunate and you were still on a dial-up connection, that would take you almost uh, two days, a day and 10 hours to download that file. Versus if you were in Reedsburg and you had a fiber to the premise connection of one gigabit per second, you'd get that same file in seven seconds. Uh, substantial difference that kind of gives you the continuum of how these uh, different technologies impact downloading and uploading large files. Another way to visualize that is each one of these dots is a different speed. Uh, 
the uh, smaller dots at the top, the blue one and the orange one, those are some of the uh, kinds of speeds you would get off of the old copper infrastructure. A T1 line, one and a half megabits per second is that little orange dot. 160 megabits is that yellow dot. And then this outside perimeter, this line, that would, if you visualize these as the size of a pipe, the outside circle is the gigabit uh, connection. That's the size of that pipe compared to the other ways that some people are getting, uh, most people are getting uh, broadband today. This is why I think it's um, uh, important, and uh, this is the former chairman of the FCC, but he said we're in a global bandwidth race. A nation's future economic security is tied to frictionless and speedy access to information. And I believe that. I think broadband's gotten to the point where it's as important as a lot of other things that we think about as being necessary infrastructure. The, the roads, the uh, uh, telecommunications, electricity, all of those things are important and I think broadband fits in with those. So one of the things I'm always asked about is, well, how do we compare to our neighbors? How do we compare to other states? How do we compare to the rest of the country? And as uh, uh, Janikowski said, this really is a global issue. It's about competing in the global marketplace. And I think one of the things that's discouraging is that if you look at the United States, we used to be a leader in broadband. Some people would say in certain areas we still are. But if you looked at the average connection speeds, the United States is number nine. And this data comes from Akamai, which, and the reason I like this is they've got thousands of servers across the globe, and they're measuring actual uh, file uh, transmission speeds, so it's not advertised speeds. Uh, the advertised speeds of the providers is the actual speeds. So the U.S. ranked ninth, or eighth. When we looked at uh, the percentage of the households that were getting at least four megabits per second download, and that's kind of the standard that's in the national broadband plan for residences, U.S. isn't even in the top 10. Uh, when we look at the number of high-speed connections over 10 megabits per second, United States is number nine. And this is the part that bothers a lot of folks, about the only area where we seem to be leading is in the price of broadband. So this is a comparison of countries that uh, actually offered some of the higher speed broadband at 45 megabits per second. And this blue bar is the price per month. And you can see, well, you can see that the speeds actually were slower in the US, but our, our costs uh, were greater than all those other countries. So when we start, when I start looking at broadband, uh, it's interesting that it wasn't that long ago that one gigabit service was, was kind of the uh, uh, ultimatum. That was the thing that people were shooting for. And I started to map out communities across the country that where you could currently get gigabit service. And I've been able to identify 22. I just added another one uh, yesterday that I found out about in Missouri. And so these are the 22 locations. You can see Reedsburg. Uh, is the one spot in Wisconsin. And, and what I'll tell you is I only mapped out the communities that had a published rate uh, for that one gigabit per second uh, service. There are other providers in Wisconsin that do provide up to a gigabit per second, but you have to call them for a rate, and it depends on a lot of things. I didn't include them because it's difficult to get a rate. But the average price uh, for those 22 municipalities offering one gigabit per second was around $210, which is interesting because I think that's actually fairly close to what Reedsburg is charging, something 230 240 something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll come back to these prices uh, in a bit. This is something uh, that I find interesting. So you look around the country and you find these 22 communities that are providing gigabit service to <coughs> businesses and residents for an average of about $220 per month. This is the BadgerNet rate. This is the rate that our private consortium of telephone companies is charging our financially strapped schools and libraries in the state. The rate, I'm not making this up, the, the rate for gigabit service is $11,652 per month. I just got done telling you these other 22 communities are charging hundreds of dollars that's the rate. Well, there isn't anybody in the state that I, that's paying that rate, and there isn't a school or library in this state that could afford to pay that rate. But all of these other rates, you can see, you can go right up to the top of the chart in a 256 kilobit per second, basically a dial-up connection. The Badger rate, uh, BadgerNet rate here is higher than what those communities are providing a gigabit for. I, I, I can elaborate on that. Sure. Being the tech director at River Valley. Sure. Um, those are 
those are retail rates. Right. And I'm, we are paying 250 a month for right. a night. Right. So what people need to understand is that the the rates are subsidized through the universal service fee. We, the taxpayers, pay that all the rate, though, whether it's the subsidy plus the 250 that you pay. So ultimately, it's the taxpayers that are paying these rates. These are the teach rates. So this, this is, well, if you look at this, the schools and libraries, and let me say this is a good thing. More, more libraries are getting fiber to the premise under a new initiative, and the schools if they could get 100 megabits per second, are paying this $250. We, the taxpayers, though, are paying that total $2,500 a month for that 100 megabit per second circuit. So again, we're paying a lot for the connectivity that we get uh, in Wisconsin. Now, the International Economic Development Council does a survey of its members every year. And in the last survey, less than 10% of the members felt that four megabits per second was going to be enough to advance uh, their local economies. And again, that's the residential standard. So most of these ED professionals think we need much greater than that minimum uh, level of connectivity. And I'm going to race through a couple of numbers here just to give you an idea of why I think this is important. <clears throat> Minnesota business establishments that use broadband report median annual revenues that are approximately 200,000 higher than businesses that do not use broadband. Nearly 60% of small businesses report that broadband availability uh, is an essential factor in making a decision on their location. This study was actually a couple years old, uh, but I went through it and I think it's actually a very conservative estimate. They uh, estimated that for the U.S., by not having everybody connected, it's costing this country about $55 billion per year. If you just do the rough math, uh, Wisconsin's one of 50 states, about 2% of the population. That's about a billion dollars per year uh, here in Wisconsin. So that's just the back of the envelope calculation. If you divide by the population, that's about $175 per citizen or here in Sauk County, uh, it's probably costing uh, Sauk County residents about $11 million by not having everybody connected sufficiently in the county. This is uh, another uh, study, and I think this quote really puts things into perspective. If you looked at the internet economy as a, 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 as a, an internet, if the internet economy was a country, it would rank in the top five behind only the U.S., China, Japan, India, but ahead of Germany. And that same study looked at, well, what is the value of broadband connectivity to residents? And this will probably surprise some folks. But through surveys, they were able to determine the value, and they placed that value for U.S. residents at about $3,000 per year. 83% of people were willing to give up fast food for a year before they gave up broadband. 73% said they'd give up alcohol for a year uh, before they gave up their internet. 21% said they'd give up sex before they'd give up internet. So for a lot of folks, this is pretty important stuff. If you look at the e-commerce information, a lot of people will say, uh, well, e-commerce, uh, it only makes up 4.7% of total retail sales. But what's important here are the trends. Uh, retail sales in general uh, increased by 6.8% over a five-year period of time between 2006 and 2011. During that same time frame, e-commerce sales grew by 72%. So we've gone from 2.9% of total sales to 47 Another thing a lot of people don't realize, they think about um, e-commerce as being Amazon.com or eBay, eBay sales. 49% of the manufacturing shipments in this country were attributable to e-commerce. Uh, this was a Minnesota extension project where they were trying to build um, business presence online. They found in 2012 that less than 50% of the businesses even had a website. They had very little uh, web presence. Fewer than 20% were using social media, and less than 10% had claimed their Google Map spot. And what's important here, it isn't just about build it and you'll come. We need to build the infrastructure, 
but then we need to get people using it so that we get the kinds of economic impact that broadband can deliver. How many of you have been to Wisconsin Public Service Commission website? Tom, I know you have. Any, who else? So the PSC has been starting to uh, collect better uh, mapping data uh, and also trying to lay out a plan to increase broadband in Wisconsin. And we're beginning to get better information that I could think can help us make some more informed decisions. We still have a long way to go, but I want to go through some of that data because I think it is uh, useful. There's a relatively new uh, Wisconsin broadband dashboard uh, that has a lot of the data that I'm going to be sharing with you, but I wanted to try to provide some interpretation for that. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting, and I think they probably did a, a disservice in labeling these, the state by county is categorized in terms of the percentage of unmet demand. And if you look at SOC, they're, they've determined that SOC is, has a very low level of unmet broadband need. But by that, that means something less than 30% of the population. So the, the definition for that map is that if a third of the population doesn't get adequate broadband services, then that's a very low unmet need. And I think a lot of people would take issue with that. And obviously these other counties have even significantly higher uh, levels of unmet need. If we start looking, here, this is the data that helps us figure out, and some of this is fairly obvious, why we're not able to get everybody the broadband that they need. If you look at the average persons per square mile for these unmet demand groups, in the areas that have very low unmet need, it's 464 people per square mile. For the problem areas, the very high, it's 33 people per square mile. There's not enough rooftops to make this profitable for most uh, broadband providers. And then to compound the issue, those areas that have very high levels of need also tend to have lower income, so they have less ability to pay for that broadband. And then we could go into the geography, right? The north woods, the trees, the hills and the valleys that we have down here in the Driftless region. This is a significant problem. We've got about 560,000, half a million people in Wisconsin that live in areas where there is not wireline broadband service from a provider advertising what the FCC declares to be uh, a minimum uh, broadband defined speed. Just over 50% live in counties that are classified as high or very high unmet demand. So you can see that why the PSC might be focusing on those highest need counties because there's a large concentration of people that don't get uh, adequate broadband in those counties. Here's another little bit of bad news, and I know in the back of the room these are going to be really small. Uh, the PSC and their consultants just put together a cost model to try to figure out, well, what would it cost to connect the last remaining portion of the population with a minimum connection of 4 megabit download, 1 megabit upload through a wireline solution? And I won't get into the details of the model, but it's basically placing what are called these lamps in close enough proximity to the residents to get them that level of service. This is the scale of the problem. When you add in the five-year operating cost of almost a half a million dollars with the construction cost of almost a million, over five years, it's a $1.4 uh, billion dollar, uh, problem. It's a huge number. So $1.4 billion to get everybody in the state uh, at least a four megabit download, one megabit upload uh, connection. That would fill the gap. So on a per capita basis, this is by, again, the categorization of, of counties uh, from a high of 893 to $26 uh, per person. Uh, cost per beneficiary, uh, again, some pretty high numbers there. Now, what's even more disturbing is that and we just, we just saw this. The FCC has a, an experimental rural broadband uh, funding opportunity, and a lot of our providers recently put in a, a letter of interest for that. And I was reading some of those letters, and if you read those letters, even many of those companies are now recognizing that the copper infrastructure needs to be replaced. It needs to be upgraded. 
So that number I just gave you, 1.4 billion, is really based on taking that old infrastructure and at least getting it to everybody in the state. But again, it's not going to meet uh, future needs. It may meet yesterday's needs. It won't meet uh, tomorrow's needs. So then we look at wireless. The interesting thing about wireless is the construction costs are slightly less, about 807 million, but the operating costs over five years are pretty significant, 1.8 billion. So another uh, 2.6 billion to build out uh, an LTE service that would reach everybody in the state at about 10 megabits per second service. The other problem is it's not about either or. Uh, we need both robust wired broadband and mobile broadband. I'm sure many of you have broadband at home and then you also carry a smart device. It's not about uh, having just wireless or wired. But here's the interesting thing, is, as overwhelming as those numbers are, when you start to look at the return on that investment, here's what they found, that if they built out that wireline uh, broadband to, to the people that need it in the state, it would generate about 1,900 jobs per year and about 290 million in business sales. Now if those revenues all flowed back to the people that were actually paying the bills, that's less than a five-year payback period for that wireline solution. It's less than a seven-year payback period for that wireless solution. So it's a, lot of, it's a lot of money, but the return is also great for this state. So it kind of puts that uh, into perspective. So here's what the data looks like um, for Sauk County, and I'm gonna go through these quickly. The, this is the wired broadband, and you can see we're in plain. Plain's pretty well served by wired broadband, actually very well served. But you can see this ring around uh, plain, which is getting service of less than three megabits per second, so they're getting a wired service that doesn't meet the definition of broadband. Not huge numbers of people living in these areas, and you can start to look at the incorporated communities. Most of the incorporated communities have pretty decent service. In fact, this puts it in uh, bar chart form. Uh, there's less, uh, the uh, yellow bar is the percentage of people that are getting less than three megabits. It's something less than 10,000 people uh, here in Sauk County. But 10,000 people uh, is a little over 25% of your population. Fixed wireless, I won't even talk about that much because it's not a huge piece in Sauk County, but uh, the map shows very little uh, fixed wireless broadband. That color is less than uh, three megabits per second. Wouldn't meet the definition. Fixed wireless, um, you can see uh, very few people are getting anything via fixed uh, wireless. This again is the less than three megabits per second. Those that are getting it, uh, that's about the speed that they're getting. Mobile wireless looks a lot better, uh, but the one thing I'll point out, and you all know this, you don't see many dead spots on this map. You probably could all come up here and put a pin on the map telling me where those dead spots are. And I'm gonna come back to that. That's something we need are some better maps. And I know Steve is also looking at, well, where are the holes in the county that need to be filled for uh, mobile wireless? But in general, uh, if you're not in a, in a valley, those speeds aren't bad. I can tell you though that driving down here, I was running the mobile pulse application and the speeds I was getting for Verizon were awful on the whole trip uh, uh, through Sauk County. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here just a second. So that's the combined wired and wireless for the county. You would think, well, the whole county's pretty much covered, right? Well. The data also shows that there are some uh, issues. And before I get to that, I want to show that we are making some progress. So this is, this side of the map is uh, 2011 data. That's the most recent data. This is, this is uh, wired solutions. You can see more blue coverage in the more recent data than there was in 2011. So there is some progress. Lots of progress on the wireless side. You can see in a two-year period of time, uh, the increased darker coverage is the higher speeds and where we've gone in two years. So we have made progress. But when we did the demand survey, and some of you probably participated in that, you had the opportunity to tell the PSC, well, those maps are all fine and dandy. The data comes from the providers. Uh, 
and it, they've done the best job they can. It's at the census block level, so if one person in that block is served, it's shown as all served. The surveys that were done uh, tell a slightly different picture and start to, to put some uh, holes into that service on the map. Uh, there's not a huge number of business responses uh, for Sauk County and the biggest problem with the uh, demand survey was there was a huge number of people that completed the survey in Sauk County, about 1,300 people, but a large percent said they didn't want to be mapped, they didn't want their address included. So it makes it very difficult to map it out, but I'll show you what the data looks like. There was 1,365 residential surveys. Uh, only 9% of those didn't have an internet connection. But again, I think this is still a high percentage. 28% indicated their connection wasn't adequate. They had some level of broadband, but it wasn't meeting uh, their current need. Most of the service that was not meeting people's needs, uh, they would report the technology they had and then whether or not you were getting the level that you needed. A lot of that was copper, the DSL. About a third of the DSL customers said that they weren't getting the speeds that they needed. Not a surprise here, about 60% of the satellite uh, services people reported it wasn't getting them uh, the speeds that they needed. Uh, this is really, uh, so then when people were asked, well what are the sp speeds that you need? Actually the speeds that are identified are pretty modest uh, for the most part. But the one thing that's interesting is that 12% didn't respond to the question and uh, a lot of people actually didn't know the answer uh, to that. But a lot of people were satisfied with some pretty low levels. 26% thought that uh, 4 megabits to 10 megabits would be more than fine. And actually a pretty small percent greater than 10 megabits. 34% uh, said that they needed something greater than 10. Now the PSC uh, is developing a broadband assessment tool that's going to help consumers determine the bandwidth that they need. It'll go through a series of questions on your activities and what you use it for and will tell you that what you likely need and then it will show you the providers in the area that provide that level of service and if there isn't a provider there's going to be an opportunity to request a proposal uh, from the provider. So if you need 10 megabits there isn't a current provider providing that, there'll be an opportunity to submit a request for proposal and have the providers respond back to you if they can provide better service. Uh, so that's the, uh, it's, this just came up online this week and uh, providers will also have the opportunity to go into that database and see, well, who are the consumers that identified themselves as needing more bandwidth? So they can go in there and they can say, well, that's interesting. We've got 15 customers or 20 customers in this area that need better service. Maybe that's a place where we need to be making additional investments. So I think that that has some value that's just starting. And again, if you download the presentation, you can go to the uh, uh, Public Service Commission's website or you can just Google uh, Link Wisconsin. That's the uh, PSC uh, website and there's a link to the uh, broadband assessment tool. This is troubling, and I know it's troubling to the providers, and that gets back to what I said earlier. Consumers, when they put a value on this, say that broadband is worth about $3,000 per year, but are they really willing to pay $250 a month? The answer is no. Most of the providers in the room would, would say that. But the, the uh, survey that was done actually kind of supports that as well. Uh, very few people are willing to pay larger amounts. Only 2.3% said $80 or more in Sauk County. 2.6% said between 70 and 80. And most of them were in this range of something less than uh, $50. Now, what I think is interesting is, you know, I live in Middleton just outside of Madison. I don't have to do anything to get good broadband. I've got numerous providers and I can actually get some very robust connectivity for less than $50. The challenge is how are we going to replicate that in rural areas like Sauk County? And unfortunately, you aren't like me. You can't just sit back and wait for a provider to come and give you what you need, which is what I get in, in Middleton and Madison. It's going to take some work uh, to try to work with the, the providers on a public-private partnership that gets you the connectivity that you need. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Uh, so some of the things I think are going to drive bandwidth beyond what even the consumers are identifying. 
26% of the people that filled out that sur uh, survey said that they were doing uh, some level of telecommuting, working from home. That's going to require uh, greater connectivity. 37% uh, of those households uh, indicated that their internet isn't sufficient. So again, from an economic development standpoint, for the home-based businesses or people wanting to work from home, we need to figure out a way to get them better connectivity or what will happen. They have choices of where they live and a lot of people just aren't going to choose to live in places that don't have adequate connectivity. So I mentioned this quickly. Um, Mobile Pulse, I think, is a really cool uh, application. And what it is, is it's what I would call a crowdsourcing application. It uses the population to get better data. So I'm running this on my phone right now. This is what I was using when I entered Sauk County to start gathering data. And it's just collecting data that then is uploaded to the PSC that they can then start mapping out and correcting some of the, uh, the uh, maps that we have for wireless coverage. And uh, PSC is trying to encourage more citizens to, to uh, put that application on their phone and start getting better data so that we can start filling in the holes in the state. So if people are interested in that, you can call or you can contact Coulter Sikora at the Public Service Commission. That's his email address. There's two different tools. The one that we need a lot of people uh, putting on their phone is the uh, full-blown mobile pulse application. The problem is, uh, and it depends on the parameters you set up, it can use a lot of data on your data plan. So I happen to be one of the few people that still has an unlimited data plan. I don't care. Uh, so I feed a lot of data to the PSC. If you have people in this county that have an unlimited plan or have a big data plan, we'd encourage people to contact, or contact Coulter. If you don't have a big data plan, there's kind of a consumer grade uh, app that you can put on your phone. And if you just go to the uh, Play Store or the uh, Apple Store for your device and you Google Link Wisconsin, all one word, you'll find the app that you can load on your smart device and that'll begin to provide some uh, data. And I just find it interesting as I'm traveling around, I look at those speeds and you can start to get a sense of where the problems are. So I'm just, these all go quickly and then I'm going to turn it over because this isn't all about me just talking. Uh, one of the cool things is when they started uh, this mobile app, there were a limited number of people actually collecting the data points. So these were all data points that were being collected by the, that application between March and November of 2013. Then the PSC got the DNR wardens to start putting this on their phone. So if you think about the plow drivers in the county, the sheriff's deputies that are driving around, people that ha are driving around the county are the people that you want to get that into the hands of. And so this is starting, I'll just do, go through this quickly to show the success that they're starting to have with getting data points. And this is all over a short period of time. This is just since last year. And the DNR wardens were really helpful, uh, just starting to collect data points during the deer hunting season. But we need more people collecting that data. And you can see actually a fair number of holes down here in southwest Wisconsin where we don't have any data points. And uh, I think this data would be useful for a lot of reasons, including our providers that are providing wireless. They have probably their own data that's pretty useful. But uh, the, the, the demand survey and this mapping data should help our providers think about where are the next investments that need to be made. That's it. I know I went through a lot in a short amount of time. Uh, you all have my contact information, and we do want to move on to a more interactive part of the program. I do have additional copies of Andy's contact information if anyone needs it. Maybe I'll just, you could take them and pass them down. I want to also mention if you uh, didn't get a copy of Andy's presentation, I already have it uploaded on our Sauk County UW Extension website. So if you just search for Sauk UWEX, uh, it'll, it'll pop up, and you can see the entire presentation there as well. So I just want to make sure I noted that. I have another extra copy, too, if somebody needs it. So what I'd like to do, you see how this works? <laughs> you all have some clickers. I'm going to see if I can make these work. Um, I have a couple extra here. I'm going to switch gears for a second. Maybe while I'm switching gears, Andy, if you want to take a, maybe a couple of questions while I'm uploading. Yeah, we can do that. What, what, are there questions on people's mind? I know I went through a lot of stuff. Yeah. 
how much the schools were paying. Yeah. How much the South County government paid. I couldn't tell you that. Um, and you know what I showed you was the BadgerNet rate, and not all of our public facilities are are using BadgerNet. And uh, and the other thing I would tell you is that um, many of the providers are actually uh, providing some services below what you saw on those published rates. But almost always they have at least one circuit at the rates that were up there because they can get that one circuit uh, subsidized by the Teach program, the universal service fee. But I, I couldn't tell you what Sauk County uh, is paying for their connectivity. Somebody here might have a better idea than, than I would. Tim Steve, uh, we're connecting to the services. Oh, yeah. We have our own fiber group around the county, and we can hand off some of that. So we don't pay a monthly fee for our service. If you're asking questions, please uh, let Jenny know so that she can just. I'll try, to, I'll try to get around to the. I, I, I do know that with, with the schools, the um, uh, system for <clears throat> the Badger Net connectivity, the 250 a month, mm -hmm. that applies to only one right. connection. Right. So, like River Valley's exactly. got. Exactly. Four or three outlying elementary schools that have to have a different connection uh, at a different rate, usually much higher. <clears throat> it's yeah. So I'd, that's a that's a great point. So yeah, each school district gets one subsidized circuit, which often means that there are facilities in the district that are underserved. And I know I, we in your introduction you talked about the broadband grant. We we set up. Uh, help the community of Superior set up a community area network to connect their public institutions. And they were able to connect all of their school uh, facilities except for Four Corners. And Four Corners is quite a bit south of Superior. It's actually one of the, the poorest uh, elementary schools or in one of the areas. They've got terrible connectivity. And from my perspective, there's some huge equity issues there in that those kids don't get the same level of connectivity as the other elementary and middle school. They also don't get great connectivity at home. And then what do we do? We throw them into the high school, and they're competing with other kids where that's second nature. And they've already accustomed to having good connectivity and knowing how to use that technology. So there's a lot of fairness issues here. And part of, this, part, part of the problem is just the cost. It's so there isn't enough money to subsidize all the circuits that are needed. And you have counties like Sauk County that have figured out that yeah, we've got a lot of county facilities that are using large amounts of data, and they've built their own fiber networks to serve some of those uh, facilities. And it's because of the kinds of data needs. And I was listening to an FCC webinar program just yesterday, and this, this reinforces this idea that the bandwidth needs are just continuing to go up. There was a presenter from Utah, and they're already increasing their one gigabit per second circuits to their schools to 10 gigabits per second. Uh, so one gigabit per second is approximately 100 times faster than what most of you in this room are getting unless you live in Reedsburg. Uh, so we're talking about some incredible speeds and in trying to build uh, next generation networks, networks that are going to meet future needs. Any other questions for Andy? Yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Bart Olson from Merrimack Communications. Yeah. And uh, I really don't like the TEACH program because uh, apparently this BadgerNet thing is where uh, AT&T went and got together with several other big phone companies like Frontier. Yeah. And then they made a, you guys made an agreement with them, the state of Wisconsin? Not me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. For BadgerNet. Yeah. Anyway, it runs through yeah. 216. Yeah. Okay. Now the deal is my customers, my phone customers, pay uh, the Wisconsin USF fund that's right. on each one of their uh, bills. Right. And we pay into that. But uh, then, uh, what I, re I, I didn't understand this before. I thought that the Wisconsin USF fund would subsidize any carrier hmm. to build out these uh, networks. But that's not true. Yeah. The TEACH program, uh, which is from the USF, right. only subsidizes the BadgerNet program, right. which is, of course, my competitor, Frontier. Right. And uh, AT&T, basically, that, you know, that, that's where it is. Now. The problem with that is Sauk Prairie School District has two uh, remote schools, one in Blackhawk and uh, one out here in uh, Tower Rock. 
And uh, if, uh, and I figured this out the other day, you know, if I would have been gotten the same teach subsidy for those circuits, I would have built fiber out to Tower Rock, I would have built fiber out to Blackhawk, and I would have served those 85 households in Whitman and Blackhawk that are on the way with that money. But that's not the way it works in this business yeah. because, the, you know, it's kind of a fixed deal and AT&T and the state of Wisconsin are, are into this deal. And it wouldn't be so bad except that all of the people here are paying this USF, federal USF yeah. and state USF on their phone bills. Right. Anyway. So people are going to probably go back and look at their phone bills and you'll see the universal service fee tax that you pay. And you're right. It's, but the one thing I would say and what, what AT&T and the phone companies would probably say is that when the Department of Administration put this out for bid, it was actually put out for bid, what happened is you're absolutely right. AT&T was the uh, primary contractor and then they partnered with all these other private providers, mostly I think maybe all telcos, and uh, they created this badger net. And, uh, responded with a proposal to DOA that was accepted and so that's the consortium that provides these services that's discounted uh, with the TEACH program funded by the universal service fee you're right yeah and those those fees are are pretty hefty we could probably do one more question before we move into the next segment which is also in our you know opportunities for yeah, questions sure. so is there any other specific questions for Andy before we move on okay so I want to, um, like I said, try something out here. I, it gave most of you clickers. I apologize. I only have, I think, 50 clickers. So um, if you didn't get one, I apologize. But what I'd like to do is just uh, start a conversation in, in, about uh, some of the issues that Andy has already touched on. And I have a, a couple of slides, maybe only five. And what I'd like you to do is use your clicker to kind of vote on your response. And then we'll be able to show how, how the room responded. Does that make sense? So go ahead and answer this question. How important is broadband expansion in your community? And hopefully this will work. I see responses down here in the bottom going up, so that's a good sign. Maybe, I think maybe I have tw 25 of those things. Oh, no, more. I have at least 29. <laughs> I should have counted how many I had before I got here. If you if you answer twice, it'll just change, change your answer your to whatever answer. you yeah. whatever you put in the second time. So I think I must have thirty. So let's just see how. Okay, so I have uh, forty three percent of you feel it's really very important, and thirty three are at critical. Um, does anyone want to share uh, why they why they chose their response? Okay, Donna, I'm coming. I can speak pretty loud. <laughs> I don't think the metro is working. It is? All right. Well, basically, I believe it's not so much for the current generation, but if our children are going to be competing and our grandchildren are going to be competing in the global marketplace, and if they're going to be doing a lot of their work from home, they need this. It's critical. Otherwise, we're going to fall far behind. Did you want to share your? I, I would like to share. Um, the last uh, election, four years ago, I had a real tough time finding anything out about any of the candidates. Uh, even online, it was quite difficult. But I, you know, you're not going to get that kind of information, uh, enough information in the local media. And you really have to be able to have access to multiple sources, I think, because you can't really trust the perspective of only one source. So I really think that that is uh, a factor in our being able to make intelligent decisions for our future. So it sounds like you both clicked critical. Anyone else want to share? <coughs> okay, Dennis, I'm coming your way. Yeah, I guess I look at it, uh, we're seeing uh, home-based businesses, businesses in general expanding, going more to internet. We've got the inter education system that's moving more into it. Uh, our infrastructure that we've got out here now was pretty good two years ago, but as people are getting onto the broadband, the system that's there is being taxed even more. In other words, it, it you know we aren't 
the service isn't as good as it used to be simply because there's so many people feeding off from it. So, you know, I, I think if, you know, some of the figures Andy brought up there from the standpoint of what it's cost in this country uh, and in our communities not to have it, I, you know, I'm seeing it with uh, home-based businesses in the area, uh, local businesses that are, are being affected by it. I, uh, I voted number B, or letter B, not somewhat important, because the constituents in my area that contacted me, they don't want a satellite dish on their house trying to get an internet connection. They want fiber optic. That's plain and simple. They are fed up with the satellites, the slow speed, the not being able to get reception at all, and so that's why I voted that way. Um, anyone else? That, Jim, did you have a, your hand up? Okay. Oops, sorry. I'm going to take it from the economic development standpoint. Uh, when I'm trying to bring companies into this county uh, or to help companies that are here expand, the number one question they ask is, what is your broadband? What level of broadband do you have? Now, we do have a selling point with Reedsburg because we're one we have one gigabit uh, community, and there is only a maximum, I understand, of 23 total in the whole country. So it's really, really important if, for the economy of this county if, uh, if we want it to grow, and we want to, be, and we want to have a better cost of living and a better uh, way of living in our county, we have to have broadband. Hi, this is Dave from uh, Y Connect Wireless. We've been providing um, high-speed internet to uh, a good portion of Sauk County and a large portion of Richland County now for seven years. And um, one of the one of the concerns I have is one, I wasn't even invited to this meeting, and I provide uh, service to most of the areas that we've been talking about already this evening. Um, We've been uh, providing these services without uh, public funding, without bank financing. I've been providing these services by adding customers, keeping happy customers, and building out services on, um, well, right now we have 86 silos that we have equipment on in Sauk and Richland County. Uh, that's a cost-effective solution that is uh, able to bring up to 20 megs of internet to anybody's home within a two-mile range of that silo. Um, my, my concern is is that a lot of times uh, the little folks that are out there making a difference get missed. So I want to make sure that I'm here and being represented with uh, the kinds of things that we do. Some of the areas that we cover are uh, valleys that aren't going to be covered by any, unless you put a towel right at the head of it because of the terrain that we live in. And those are the kinds of solutions that we provide. So, Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question. I can get back to my mouse up here. Okay, oops. <coughs> so what is the most difficult roadblock or obstacle for expanding broadband usage in your community? Why don't you weigh in? I still have a few folks yet to vote. Maybe that's all I'm going to get. Okay. All right. Availability is the big winner. Providers are unwilling to provide what I need. Um, and nobody chose lack of hardware. Um, Few folks chose other. Is anyone willing to talk about why they chose other? Okay, I'll be right there. You know.
you know, we've complained about infrastructure in this regard. We could also look at the roads and the schools and have the same complaint. But you made a good point how we went about it. My preference would have been to do it the way REA was done and the way we did most things in this country until we were seized with the idea that we needed to become a third world country as quickly as possible. Uh, and that was essentially to do it through regulation to tell the phone companies who had the hard wire that essentially you will roll out broadband access and after that you will roll out fiber optic, which is after all just pulling the thing through a pipe. It's not like digging the trench for most of it. And we will have these levels of service and if you can't, if it's economically impossible, you'll at least provide a satellite. I was on DSL until two years ago and I'm mad in hell. I mean, it just crippled me. Uh, that's because Verizon, uh, Mr. Seidemann, who headed Verizon, woke up one morning and decided that uh, landlines were dead. Mm -hmm. He then proceeded to sell what he had to, I thought, a pretty shaky company with a pretty bad history. Uh, I could go into that, but I'm sure the representative here wouldn't like that. But it's how we've done it. This should be done through regulation. It's other. It's that we didn't use what we knew about how you get these things done. We just sort of fumbled it. And we've got the result now. So we're sitting here supplicating the providers, oh, please, won't you put in fiber optic? Now, you tell them to put in fiber optic, and you figure out how to share the cost. It, 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 to me, it's just a, a great cluster. Anyone else want to weigh in on this one? A couple. All right, Steve, I'm coming your way. My exercise here. When I look at the four items, uh, our experience as a provider is that you don't pick one of those, they're uh, serial. So uh, when people don't have availability, availability is the most difficult roadblock. Once you have availability, are you willing to or have the money to pay for it? And then suddenly price becomes the roadblock. And once you've got a service that you can afford and it's available to you, then you can't believe how many people have subscribed to internet and then realize they need a computer. <laughs> and then it becomes the cost of the computer or the laptop or whatever. So it's sort of a mix of price and hardware. And then there's what do I do with it and how do I do this? And so, you know, the, the, the tact we've consistently taken is that it's more than providing availability in rural areas. There's a huge education component and there's a huge price point because while gigabyte service is really desirable and I love it, um, I'm not probably the poorest person here, but I wouldn't afford $250 a month in my household budget. Um, I just canceled DVR because my Time Warner bill was $162, and by getting rid of DVR, you know, it came down to 115 which I still think is outrageous. So I, I think that those four items are more serial than they are pick one or the other. That's a good point, and I don't think that they're meant to necessarily really be mutually exclusive. It's more about just kind of starting the conversation. Any, any other comments on this particular question, or are we ready to move on? Okay. My name is Dave Terpster, and uh, a couple things that I have noticed, uh, my wife Vicki and I actually worked at rolling out broadband in the rural areas out here for a couple years. And uh, like Dennis was saying, we kind of ran into infrastructure ceiling where we just couldn't put any more people on the network. So I uh, ended up getting out of the business. Um, one of the biggest things that I've seen is there was a, a vote with the Sauk County Board. Uh, there were some federal funds available that would have created construction projects and ongoing work for citizens in the area, internet access via wireless, on uh, multiple telecommunications towers that were backed um, by another company. Um, so it wouldn't have cost the taxpayers anything, but it just doesn't seem like there's political will to really take this on as an issue and push it forward. Um, and I've been to hundreds, maybe thousands of people's houses and businesses in the area trying to get service to them, and you know a lot of them we couldn't 
And uh, for the ones that we could, you know, it did make a difference for the business. Uh, companies are trying to do custom fabrication, so they've got pretty uh, detailed data uh, paths for their customers, and uh, they need the bandwidth for that kind of stuff. So I think it's political will would be other. Thanks. Any response? Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. <laughs> So imagine our area as a broadband connected community five years from now. Uh, what does it look like? few more folks I'm waiting for to vote. Hold them back. <coughs> okay. Um, oh. All right. Close the polling. That was kind of an easy one. <laughs> the way we work, interact, and access services and do business will improve our quality of life. Um, a couple folks thought they didn't, it wouldn't look a lot different than it does now, and a couple folks are not sure. Is anyone willing to talk about um, some of their thoughts about that? Our way in. Share any ideas? Donna? I can remember back when um, my husband was a senior systems analyst and we kept saying, are we going to have a home computer soon? I had little primary aged boys. One of them still wasn't in school. And uh, we got a computer eventually. And I caught them in the office having a high old time with that piece of machinery. They got it was like second nature as soon as they hit the keyboard. So in some ways I'm not sure how this will impact somebody else's life. I'm still podding along at uh, my putt-putt rate on the computer and doing things that I do, but I only do what I like. I think they do the same thing. One is, um, well he designed Packers.com. And he does websites and he's written a book on how to do this sort of stuff and how to make different softwares to each other and that sort of thing. The other one is, uh, you need a program? Okay, I'll do it. And it's natural to him. Most of us don't know how to do that in this room. It's not native to you. And so, you know, it's going to be different for the kids that are coming up. And that's what we're not sure how they're going to make these changes and what they're going to create. Thanks, Donna. Your story actually reminded me. I have a, I have a four-year-old son, and uh, sometimes he likes to pretend he's going to be a doctor. And so he says, okay, let's, let's pretend we're going to be a doctor. The first thing he does is he goes to the laptop, flips it open, and pretends to start typing. And I thought, well, that is not what I think of when, I, when I'm uh, thinking about uh, pretending to be a doctor. But so it's just a different way of thinking. Anyone else want to weigh in? I got, okay, one last question. Um, so what's the one thing you think we should be focusing on right now to improve broadband access in underserved, area, underserved areas? So the polling is open.
Okay, I'm going to close the polls. Let's see what we came up with. Heavy on A, improving broadband availability through public-private partnerships. Some on increasing public and governmental investment. Does anyone want to share some of their reasons they chose what they chose? As a, as a school district, I'd, I'd, I would like to get involved with the county in a community area network. Get a CAN developed to connect all the police departments, hospitals, village facilities, anything that would, it, it, not to mention businesses that could come into the area. <clears throat> Anyone else want to share what they? Everyone's gotten real quiet all of a sudden. No other, anyone else? All right. All right, one last question. So, do you have any interest in being involved in efforts to expand broadband in our county? And I should mention that this question is also on the back of your evaluation. And if you are interested, let me know your contact information or email or your phone number, and um, we can uh, go from there. But just see if folks, if this is something that folks are interested in doing. Okay, I'm going to close the polls. Here we end up. All right. Quite a few. In, quite a few interested. Anyone have any thoughts on what it, what you would like to see? I mean, we talked a little bit about that, but is there anything you'd like to particularly be involved in? Any steps you would like to see happen? Ways you'd like to be involved? Silence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, sure I'm going to move on. <laughs> What's that? Make sure they fill out the evaluation. Yes. Yeah. Contact. You can fill out the evaluation if you don't want to. If you don't want to announce it, you can just write it on the evaluation. And we'll collect that. Um, before I hand it over to, I invited a couple of internet service providers here tonight uh, to talk a little bit about um, uh, what, what they're working on. And um, but before we hand it over to Brett from from uh, the Reedsburg Utility. Is there any other questions we need to address before we jump in? I should just mention, I didn't, um, I asked, this is just meant to be an informal conversation. I didn't ask Brett to put together a PowerPoint or anything like that, but just share a little bit about what uh, the Reedsburg Utility is, is up to. So I'll hand it over. Well, like Jenny said, I didn't really prepare anything, just uh, came just uh, basically give you a little history on Reedsburg Utility. Um, basically, um, I've only been at the utility for two years, so a lot of the development of what we have now was uh, under, the, under the leadership of my predecessor. Um, back in the early 2000s, um, basically, well, I guess just a step back, Reedsburg Utility is a uh, community-owned electric and water utility, and uh, this year we're celebrating our 120th year in existence, so quite a milestone. We're the uh, fourth or fifth oldest utility in the state. Uh, back in the early 2000s, we wanted to connect up our uh, substations and wells and basically our, our infrastructure for our utilities. Um, went to the service providers, uh, they weren't offering what we needed, so we decided to do it on our own. In that process, um, the school district heard about it, said, hey, can we join you in that effort? So um, they, uh, we worked with, or they worked, um, provided some uh, funding to get their uh, facilities connected. And, um, and then from that, then some businesses started hearing about it, and they started asking about service. And... Um, it just kind of started rolling from there. Then in uh, around uh, 2003, uh, the decision was made to uh, provide that same level of service to the residents of the city of Reedsburg. Um, and then um, 
back in um, 2011, I believe it was, is um, uh, USDA had a rural, uh, under the rural, rural utility service, had a broad brand grant uh, program. We applied and got a grant to build out into the northern um, roughly quarter of Sauk County. Um, and we completed that project last year and, and are providing services to, like I said, the northern quarter of Sauk County. Um, this year we rolled out then um, the gigabit services to be the first in the state of Wisconsin to offer that level of service. Um, I guess, you know, just in two years, just to kind of give you an idea of what the needs are out there or what um, people will use when it's provided to them. When I started in 2012, our pipeline out to the world was only 200 megabits. Um, by whole, offering the higher levels of service than that, we're right now doing over a gig in just two years by offering those higher level of services to people. Um, our highest speed when I started was at 10 megabits per second, and now we're up to gig, so 100 times higher than that. Um, and it's, people are using it. So I guess I don't have a whole, I mean, a whole, whole else, lot to add, but I will take questions. Um, I think one very important thing to think about, though, is the public-private uh, partnerships. Um, if you want the services, you got to put a little skin in the game, too. I mean, that's what Reedsburg did. Um, you know, the private sector wasn't going to provide it at that time, so we took, took it under our own wing and provided what we wanted. So. I got a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you, are you leasing uh, any of the uh, bandwidth that the county fiber optic system has? Are we leasing it? Are, are you using or leasing any of the... We work with the county. We, um, we provide services to them and, and we get services from them. If, if that fiber optic system wasn't available, would you be able to offer one gigabyte service in Reedsburg? Um, yes. And, and that would be through what other system? Other internet providers. Other providers. They're wholesale um, internet providers. And, and your system is basically uh, a uh, fiber optic system, or is it? We're hundred percent fiber optic. Hundred percent fiber. Yep. Okay. And I guess that'd be my only other. It was, I should have jotted down a few notes when I was sitting there, but uh, realistically, if the public sector is going to um, provide funding, realistically, it should be what's what's future proof, um, and that's going to be the fiber optic networks. Your copper lines, those are temp, you know, those are reaching their limits. Um, so, if you're throwing money at something that's not going to last, you know, look at the electrical system. I mean, those are 30, 50 year investments. So, shouldn't you do the same in your broadband system? Any other questions for Brett, Jerry? <clears throat> I believe when Reedsburg Utilities started this outbuild outside of the city of Reedsburg, the plan was to include Reedsburg, Rock Springs, Loganville, Lime Ridge phone exchanges. Have you completed serving your service to all that area? Have you got some left to go? It never included Rock Springs. Um, we do have facilities in the Hill Point and Lime Ridge. So we have uh, stuff plowed in the ground there. We got a little bit of fiber to complete yet. The winter caught up to us last year. So you intend to in get Lime Ridge and Loganville phone exchanges all covered with fiber out? <clears throat> to where the interest was at that time. Where we got ducked in the ground, we will complete. Okay. We only built out to areas that the interest came back in. So. <coughs> I've got several 
of my constituents in a town of Westfield that are within less than a mile of an existing fiber optic line that you guys just put in, what's the chances of getting them hooked onto it? Because that's what they want. I guess it would have to look at the situations. It, it, there has to be enough can interest. They, to can they call your guys' number in the office we and definitely have a take, we come out? Or? We definitely take a look at them. And one's right on a county highway, yeah. and the other one's less than a half a mile off a county highway. Several is more than one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, Steve. Yes. They keep you running Coordinate your questions so I can... Yeah. <laughs> Brett, I, I don't know if this is a number off the top of your head, but I'm just curious. Uh, you know, Reedsburg was sort of a start-from-the-beginning company, as I understand it, to serving pretty much everyone in your area. Any idea what the ultimate cost was per subscriber to go from not having broadband to having gigabyte broadband? I don't know on the the original build. Um, I guess I don't have that number off the top of my head. I mean, the figure of eighteen million that was the first build out just in Reedsburg, and then since then you've had two, another fourteen million in uh, grants that you've put in in the rural areas, right? No. Our grant was $5.2 million. That project was budgeted for $10 million, and we ended up being about $11 million projects that Reedsburg funded on that. The initial, I, I'm pretty sure it was close to $18 million for the city of Reedsburg, just from research that I've done in the past. Well, I want to thank Brett for, you, for your time, and um, you'll stick around for a few minutes and, and answer some questions afterwards, perhaps. So I, want, I want to give Steve Schneider and Vicki Terpstra, I don't know if you're both, want to share a couple of, of uh, slides um, before we wrap up tonight. So thank you, Brett. Yep, thanks. <clears throat> My comments are less than prepared because I was invited, Dave, but I, they didn't tell me I was speaking, and I see <laughs> I'm on the agenda as, as invited, uh, so that probably means, and I, uh, I probably said most of what I have to say to most of the folks here. Certainly, the county board is pretty familiar uh, with me, and I suspect there's maybe 20 of them that still agree, and I suspect Andrea and I maybe still don't agree, but that's okay. Sure. I voted against this because we were putting the county's guarantee under that loan. And I didn't think that the other counties that were involved in this were putting the full faith and credit of the people of their counties behind it. I, otherwise, I didn't have a problem with this, but it was, it was Sauk County speaking for the People of Wisconsin, uh, the people of Sauk County, and putting our name to those private loans, mm -hmm. and that was my problem with this. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I was not against broadband. It was, it was deciding that we were going to do that, and the precedent it would set, even if this was a, if this worked. It would have been fine. It would have set a precedent, and eventually we would have gotten into a deal where something didn't work. That's the way I felt. I'm sorry, I was being more anecdotal because I, I, I wasn't attacking, I was just sort of saying, so okay. I, I've talked I a lot in the, in the past, so, so I, I guess uh, what we've been doing uh, here is, uh, is not much because we sort of moved on to uh, the two counties that we went with and so part of my update uh, to you is, is more what, what we've done elsewhere and how it's working. And I'd like to make a few comments on a project that the PSC and Bug Tussle and four other companies uh, participated in called FirstNet 
which um, is a federal initiative that uh, is trying to get its feet on the ground and uh, an RFQ uh, or an RF, RF Andy something, RFI, a request for information was submitted and the, the exercise that we went through in and of itself was very interesting because what we did was we went through and identified what it would take to get mobile broadband service throughout the entire state of Wisconsin at a service level acceptable for public safety purposes. So when life and death is at risk, this system has to work. So that means 100% generator, 100% redundant fiber, the whole nine yards. And we did fairly extensive planning um, separate from the Public Service Commission, but we provided all the data and roughly 600 pages of information uh, to the PSC. And we determined that it would take about 720 towers in the state of Wisconsin where there are not existing towers, where there's not service, there's not cellular service, there's not broadband service because there's not existing infrastructure and it would cost to upgrade the existing network across the board uh, roughly seven hundred and twenty million dollars so I was sort of edified by the numbers that Andy presented saying I believe nine hundred million for LTE for the state because uh, uh, we, we're you know within some margin of, of error there um, in terms of the the networks that we're building LTE wise uh, elsewhere we've uh, committed to 30 uh, sites that we're building with MDAR funds uh, of those nine are on the air the take rate is extremely high because again the the areas that we started uh, and if you look at uh, Vicki's map I think you can see northern Adams County where it says Rome and Highway 21 uh, were the first areas that, that were uh, rolling out. On this particular map, green means LTE in that it's the higher bandwidth wireless. The orange is UMTS, which is what we're largely doing in Sauk County where we have uh, service. Um, and you'll see Sauk County down at the bottom center where Hill Point and Happy Hill. And you see the issues with propagation uh, based on the geographic uh, uh, area that you, you, you have. So in Sauk County, we've primarily put LTE in for people visiting the county, not for the residents of the county, which is what we said uh, when we were here in 2012. Uh, we were going to do if we didn't have funding to build it out. Um, my comment to the county board at that time, and I'll, I'll reiterate that tonight, is I don't think it's a matter of uh, commercial companies will not come to Sauk County. I think it's a matter of you go where you have the highest return on your investment. And the highest return for us is the Dells and the 18 corridor. And without some type of um, partnership subsidization and I'm a pretty conservative person I, you know I, in fact I think I said to Mr. Lehman before or after one of the meetings you know if I were on the, the town board and something was coming forward I don't I'd have to I think really hard whether I was in favor of it or not you know and and so you know I think we laid all the options out uh, what I really would would credit Saw County for is they debated this like I've never seen a county debate it. I think it was good government interaction where you really are understanding what you're doing even if the result isn't what I wanted. What bothers me more are some counties that we offered it to that didn't even take up the discussion that basically said we know we need it but we're not going to talk about it. Um, the map that Vicki has up here um, has a bunch of black dots on it, and I don't know if you can see that real clearly, but uh, Vicki uh, has been gathering where we get customer requests where we can't provide service. And I think when you look at the number of black dots, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot up around the Dells and down the 18 corridor in Prairie du Sac and Sauk City. 
but there's a lot of black dots uh, in the southern areas. And often we're getting a bad rap sometimes because we're trying to extend service where we're not designed to provide service. And I think Dennis Polivka made a very interesting point earlier, which is in some respects we've gone backwards. Because when you had a system that had 50 customers on it, people were getting a two or three or four or five megabit throughput on a UMTS system. When that's loaded to the maximum and you're trying to, you know, put poles on top of silos to extend coverage uh, and, and it's a fully loaded system and you don't have any more spectrum without spending more money to build towers to divide it up, all of a sudden somebody that was getting two or three meg is getting barely a meg. And uh, that, that, that is the reality in some areas. Um, you know, there's a cost to taking even our orange and updating it to green versus filling in where all those black dots are south of Hill Point and, uh, uh, you know, south into Iowa County and, and, and so on that, that you see on that, that particular map. Um, I want to respond to uh, a, a couple of earlier comments that I strongly agree with. Bart, uh, I don't know how to work with AT&T because it, it does seem fixed and, and you know, they're my partner and they're my enemy and uh, uh, it, it, it's just tough to uh, follow the rules because we would love to get USF and I think we're the definition of USF as I think you are in many of your areas. We're serving those people that no one else can serve. But there was a cap put on USF and after a certain date if you started this adventure you're not eligible. So we have never gotten one dollar from USF. Uh, on the other hand there's other carriers in the state that I won't mention that get tens of twenties and hundreds of millions of dollars from USF for Wisconsin and feel no obligation to go to these unserved areas. And that's where I agree with the gentleman who, who indicated that regulation maybe is the answer. The one thing I would say is I've read some information that if AT&T hadn't been split apart we wouldn't have the internet today because AT&T was not incented to spend more money on infrastructure which is exactly what the internet and the competitors required them to do was to look at new ways of communicating. If AT&T could have kept the internet at bay forever as a monopoly it certainly would have been uh, regulatorily efficient. Um, what's difficult right now is we providers don't know what the regulations are. We have no idea what's going to change tomorrow. There is, a, you know, when, when, when I got into the, <laughs> right, right. When I got into the industry, there was a cap of 45 megahertz that only one carrier could only have 45 megahertz of spectrum. So everybody designed their systems around 45 megahertz and then one day it changed to 100 megahertz because AT&T lobbied to get 100 megahertz because they wanted more spectrum in the metro areas. Well that did nothing for us here in Sauk County other than allow a carrier who has no intent to ever build it out. You know, the nice thing would be is if there was a regulation that said if the government has provided you the asset, you have so much time to build it out or you lose it and let somebody else do it who's going to comply with the build out. Because these areas out here have a ton of spectrum assets that have been allocated to Verizon and AT&T and others. Those assets are not being used and probably will not be used until some type of regulation forces some more orderly use of those assets. Um, we intend to build uh, an LTE network throughout Sauk County. It's not going to happen in 2014 and it may start happening in some additional areas in 2015 and it all comes down to the scarcity of capital. You know, the intent of our proposal to the county was not to offend anyone, to take the county to task, to, uh, you know, mess around with any other carriers. It was what we needed to do 
to get service to Sauk County on a ubiquitous basis and speed up the process with capital from a public partner, public-private partnership, whatever you want to call it. It's working in the two counties that we've proceeded with. There are other ways of doing it. Um, you know, our company has been doing you know, quite well with what we're doing. We are eliminating our cellular offering just because there are so many areas where there aren't cellular service where our core areas were. So this, this I think in, in some areas like Sauk County, it's not even just about broadband. There's so many areas where you can't use your cell phone in your house or around your property. And, and those areas need, need upgrading as well. So you know, our proposal and our system is we're, we're not gonna market cell phones as we were planning on. We're simply gonna go after broadband and the cell phone uh, thing will be a all LTE network years down the road. I think that, you know, in many of the very rural areas, not just in Sauk County, but in several other counties, and I'll say some of the most needy are Iowa and Lafayette and Richland and some areas around Sauk that are probably even in worse shape. Um, I, I think it's going to be three to five to six years, but one way or the other, private investment will come. Um, it's just when you're putting LTE as a big carrier into Chicago and New York and getting your systems up to date, and if you're a secondary provider and you're putting it into Appleton and Green Bay and Fond du Lac, uh, the returns are much greater than they are in Plain or Lime Ridge or, or Whitwin or Leland or Blackhawk. Any questions for me? Jerry? 38 was our design, um, 38, you have somewhere over 60 right now, um, 60 throughout the county, all carriers where, you know, there's some hills where there's three, four, five, you know, Tower Road is just like a porcupine. Um, but you know, one, one, of our, one of the issues with that is where we were putting the towers is where there were no other towers. Because what, what happened was, but because you don't want a tower, or because because there's not enough there's not enough people there to serve it. Is towers from our home east, midway between Lang Ridge and Region. They've always been there. I'm used to looking at them. True. Another question over here. Oh. Yes, for Steve or anyone else who might know. The United States of America owns the internet, but I understand they're going to give that away now. Do you have the the control of the internet data, and, and they're going to give that away now? Do you un, do you know why? The internet, by definition, no one owns or controls because everybody has a little piece of it. So you know, from my subscribers to uh, to Chicago um, I own that 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 piece of it and the federal government and the federal government really owns very little of the internet um, the large carriers own a huge piece of the internet um, you know I mean every carrier around owns a piece of the internet. Frontier owns internet from their customers to certain points down the road. Um, you know, Global Crossing, AT&T, Win, uh, Windstream, uh, I don't know, there, there, there's just a, a ton of them that own different pieces. So I don't, I don't think anybody can sell the internet carte blanche and now ownership went from the US to China or to, you know, uh, Dennis Polivka bought the whole internet nationally. You, you, you couldn't do that. I wonder if the question... Why you didn't do the job you wanted to do for the 9% and leave all liability off of the county? 9% interest versus having the county take the liability? Why I didn't? Yeah, why didn't you choose that route? Because I had other counties willing to do it for 2.6%. And because the difference between 2.6 and 9% is a lot of money over a number of years. And it's the difference between the margin that you generate in extremely rural areas and not having a margin. Uh, the other point is, um, 
it, 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 we were doing, we were talking about this during, you know, an economic major downturn where banks had sort of shut down. And so, you know, I have more access to capital today than I had in 2011, 12 when we were talking about this. You know, today I can get bank financing to do the tower portion, certainly. But you wanted Sauk County to carry the liability while you made the money. And the other counties are doing that for you today. No, I just wanted to get in, uh, high speed internet rolling in Sauk County. I was paying. Not that bad. I was paying the county. The county wasn't paying me. I haven't gotten, in fact, it cost me $87,000 to pay the legal fees that were incurred to meet the needs of Sauk County. So, but. Uh, One of the things I, I, I want to say is we want to be respectful of people's time. We said we'd be done at 7.30. I'm not going to go anywhere, and I'll stick around until people's questions are exhausted. But. I wondered if part of your question wasn't net neutrality, and I actually was wondering, Steve, how that might be impacting your, what are your concerns about uh, the ability now for companies basically to discriminate on the content that's run over networks. Are you concerned at all that... Uh, we're, we're not big enough to drive that discussion, yeah. okay. so, you know, um, net neutrality and some of these other larger, larger issues are something that are going to be driven on a national scale by the big four companies, um, big two companies primarily. Number three and four in our industry right now are sort of frightened of one and two, I think. And, and, and it's, it's, we're slowly becoming a duopoly again. And I don't know if that's good for us or bad for us, but you know, I would be shocked if my company hasn't sold out in 20 years and Dave's company hasn't sold out in 20 years. Bart's company might be around yet in 20 years, but you know we're all being pushed. I'd be surprised if Frontier is around in 20 years. Well, as, as Andy mentioned, we are at 7.30, and so I want to be sure to uh, thank folks that came out tonight to speak, including Andy Lewis and Steve Schneider and, and, uh, and Brett as well. Uh, so thanks to everyone. Let me give them a round of applause. Yep. Thanks. Um, couple of things. Uh, if you please fill out your evaluations and just leave it on the table, if you would, along with the clickers. Um, and if you need to head out at 7:30, I totally understand. If you do have additional questions and want to uh, hang out and continue our discussion.